Right, good afternoon, staff, councillors. Uh, welcome along to this extraordinary meeting of uh, Performance Policy and Partnerships Committee. Uh, those councillors who are joining on Zoom, if you can make sure that your uh, cameras are turned on to be uh, considered present, please. Mr. Morris, you can leave yours off until you're needed. We'll just let Marcus get his selfie and then we'll carry on. Um, we've no, got no apologies. Just councillors Cricket, Coot, Clark, Soper, and Abbott on Zoom. Uh, first item on the agenda is the Youth Council's report, and really it's just a matter of receiving this. Councillor Cricket, were you at that meeting? Oh, I beg your pardon, sorry, we've got a major late item, item seven. Um, which is a verbal report coming from Mr. Gibling about uh, the uh, education outside of the classroom discussion that we had on last week. Just an update on the position around that. So I'll move that it's received as a major late item, seconded. Councillor Lewis, put that all in favour. Aye. Against, Aye. carried. Have we got a minor one? Oh, sorry, the major. Sorry. I've got it the wrong way around. The major. Was the minutes because they weren't really the minor is the um, verbal update. So I'll, with Councillor Lewis's Absolutely. consent, amend the motion to receiving the major and minor later items. Absolutely, Chair. Put that all in favour. Aye. Against, Aye. carried. Third time lucky. The Youth Council report. Sorry, Councillor Crack, were you at that meeting? No, I was in isolation at the time. Do you want to move that it's received? Absolutely. I'll second it. Any questions or comments? Their first meeting of the year. Um, generally, I don't think they've gotten around to electing their heads yet, yeah, um, no. but they'll start to appear after their next meeting. Yep. Put the motion. All in favour? Aye. Against? Aye. Carried. So we've got the minutes of the committee meeting uh, on February 8th. Somebody wants to move those. Sorry, who was that? Councillor Amundsen and seconded Councillor Pottinger. Any matters arising? If not, I'll put that motion all in favour. Aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Minutes of the extraordinary meeting on February 17th. Looking for a mover. Councillor Scout, Councillor Pottinger. Any matters? And if not, I'll put that motion. All in favour? Aye. Aye. Against? Carried. The minutes from uh, February 22nd. Councillor Skelt's moved. Councillor Lewis. Any comments? I'll put that motion. All in favour? Aye. Against? Carried. Uh, application for grant funding for the 2022 ILT Learn to Swim. Steve, really, uh, oh, sorry, Mr. Cocker, I didn't see you lurking there. Welcome. Um, this is a similar procedure to what we went through last year, and just a, we need a formal resolution to apply for the funding. Yep, that's correct. Relatively straightforward. Any questions for Stephen while he's here? Two resolutions. Somebody prepared. To, oh, sorry. Were you moving, Councillor? Uh, no, Pottinger? that was question. Yep. Look, it's just regarding. Uh, has there been any indication from the ILT if there's a potential drop from? Um, this is obviously from the foundation. Uh, the funding is that right? ILT Foundation. Uh, through you, Chair. This is through the trust and the foundation. The trust and the foundation. So some from the trading arm, some from the foundation. That is correct. Okay. Yeah, I was just wondering how the foundation went through the years, you know, through the COVID. Uh, so through you, Chair, there's been no indication that right. there's any issues at this stage. Cool. We'll see how it goes at the application stage. <laughs> so looking for a mover for the two recommendations. I'll move. Councillor Abbott, seconded Reverend Cook. Are you voting or have you got a question? Councillor no, Arnold. Second. Oh, got one. Thank you. Uh, I'll put the motion then. All in favour? Aye. Against? Carried. 
Thanks, Stephen. Grant. Big red chair. Uh, so <laughs> here we get uh, to the district plan, the effectiveness and monitoring report. Do you uh, uh, want to introduce the paper for us? Yeah, sure thing. I'll just give a brief summary of the report and um, what we're talking about today. Uh, so the structure of the full report uh, attached is summarised in the four bullet points of the start of the covering committee report. Uh, one thing to note is that report the report's not seeking a decision per se. Um, instead, really, it's asking the committee to endorse our recommended directions on where to next for the district plan. Um, overall, these are, um, one, producing an Invercargill city-centric detailed housing capacity report. Uh, two, improving our understanding of natural hazards that impact on our city and its resilience and development capacity. Three, uh, continue our ongoing monitoring of the provisions within the district plan. Um, highlights of which include um, comparative volumes of the number of building consents versus resource consents. And this will assist in determining a sense of, of a conversion rate from where development goes from just needing a building consent to needing a resource consent. Improving our complaints monitoring and recording, including volumes, types and locations of complaints. Um, work on housing density and urban design requirements, including things like minimum site size and yard size and location requirements. Ensuring an integrated approach to infrastructure and equip in order to make sure our transport and three waters networks uh, well designed and resilient and just on that I think there's a good example of where perhaps this hasn't occurred um, and that's up later in on in your agenda for the naming of a new road off Gimlet Street um, and I think with that one if you have a look at the aerial you'll note there's lack of full connectivity through Gimlet Street so it's just highlighting that as, um, uh, as a potential issue in the future and looking at business and mixed use zones to ensure our existing commercial areas are vibrant and attractive to businesses and there's some further discussion in, in my report in the full report around that um, but overall um, you know from, from here I'm in the committee's hands and happy to answer any questions that you may have in terms of the report I appreciate there's quite a bit of detail in it so um, yeah anticipating there might be some queries thanks Grant so essentially we're setting a tone for how we go about a review essentially yeah Councillor Pottinger um, look, I've got two things. One is uh, is a basically following up on Vogel Street, and obviously there's a development in behind there, uh, Northwood Estate, and and just wondering what the current impact is on traffic going down Vogel Street. Obviously, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. It seems to behind there. I'm just wondering, is that an instance of something that has got too big, or or is it still under control? The traffic entering because that's the only access to it. Yeah, look, um, I haven't had any sort of... I can answer that. ...detail. Look, yeah, sure thing. Thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, around that, the uh, amount of subdivision cannot increase until there's another traffic egress progressed. Oh, OK. So is it, it's what has been consented and there are still some unfilled properties. Yeah. Um, is as far as it can go until there's another way out. Right, OK. Uh, the second question was regarding about... Um, the productive capability of land. Now, it talked about you know turning good land and you know wasting it on urban you know use or, but unfortunately around the country, um, people are turning really good farmland, planting trees on it, to claim carbon credits mm. and not using the land at all. N no thought of cutting down the trees. Now, it seems to be the government is allowing that to happen. In fact, I think they're encouraging it. Yet we, we, I see you're doing the right thing by making sure that productive, good soils are still being used for, you know, for agriculture. Yeah, I think you might have seen in the report perhaps as well um, that the minimum lot size in the rural zone for Invercargill City is actually quite small as well, at two hectares, and um, uh, there's some spatial plans shown in the report which show where subdivision has has occurred down to the minimum two hectare lot size and really is that conducive for sustained agricultural use um, because um, you know can you run a viable farm or agricultural operation or you know food source um, at two hectares uh, lot size, so 
yeah, it sort of amazes me that almost some people like that lifestyle of having land, but sometimes they end up with too much. Yeah. It's actually a bit of a curse. You know, they've got to either bail it or do something with it. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, well, certainly there is a bit of tension around the, the um, existing provisions in our district plan for what you can do as a right in the rural zone. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Question. Your Worship. Are we going to be taking action on that issue? I've been lobbied. I've been lobbied on that by uh, the rural sector and there's a, a high level of concern about Pinus radiata in particular. You've got to realise that there's different sort of horses for courses when it comes to planting trees. Are we following up on this report? From memory, Your Worship, I'm not sure that our district plan uh, provides any prescription around the types of trees that people are able to um, grow on, on their properties. Uh, but, and I know that there are some controls that are covered off regionally, but that would be something that could potentially be considered through this, this process. Thank you. Councillor Amundsen. Thanks. Um, two questions. One is, what do you think the time frame might be on the housing capacity assessment? Because um, housing is a huge need, so it would be good to have that as soon as possible. My other question is around, is it going to focus solely on um, things that the council can do or look at with the district plan, or is it able to be a little bit more broadly focused because there's other things that I think the council can affect potentially that might help enable more housing. So uh, I'll answer your second question first. I think it'll uh, be more of a broad assessment, uh, but also delve into uh, some of the actual provisions in our plan as well. You know, perhaps some provisions which might be disenabling. Um, uh, market investment, for example, in the residential 1A zone, which is our medium density residential zone. That's one of the ones that I've kind of looked into the most. Um, in terms of time frame, I mean, I would like to, um, well, we've already been um, sort of chipping away at some of the background data um, uh, over the last six months, I suppose. Um, uh, it's likely that we'll need to engage some expert um, input into that um, from the economic side of things. So, um, without holding anything uh, to anything, I'd like to say within the sort of you know, next six to twelve months. Thank you, Reverend Cook. As a follow-up to what Councillor Emerson asked, I see that you've identified a medium density zone, but you haven't um, identified any high density zones for housing. Um, and given that some of the requirements for housing are for people who don't want large houses, they just want somewhere to live, um, so one to two bedroom, small size lots, have we got any policy, have you identified any areas, has there been any work done thinking about those sorts of um, questions? So I think that, that question would um, uh, be asked and addressed in the housing capacity assessment. Um, Really, that's around the, uh, the the type, in particular, and location of housing, um, and I expect that the question of high density housing will be raised in that report as well and addressed through that. But certainly, we only have medium density residential um, provisions in our current district plan. So, just speaking to that, I think it's that's one of those areas where there's been quite a bit of movement. Um, we've seen the desire for the traditional quarter acre section uh, reducing more people looking for um, uh, low maintenance smaller properties um, the higher density does create other issues for us that we've got to work around drainage for, for example but given the pressure on housing and if we can encourage urban infill um, it's one of those things that we'd certainly want to review and I think there's been movement from when the district plan was last done to, to this point Sorry, did I miss another hand? You comfortable with that? Go ahead, thank you. Okay. Um, 
there are two recommendations that the reports received and we endorse the recommendations as outlined in part four. Councillor Amundsen's moving. I'll second it. Councillor Soper, do you have a question? No, Councillor Pottinger. Oh, sorry, there was one more question I, I did forget, forget to ask, and it's quite relevant, and, and uh, I guess today, this climate we're facing with, with drought, and uh, the report states that we are looking for more droughts that are coming. Um, is there any thought of provisions in the plan for uh, people retaining water on site, a certain amount of water for housing? I mean, it's been talked about loosely in the past, but if if this drought thing is serious, you know. Yep. Uh, there's no recommendations in the report, uh, of course. Um, I wonder if that's something that would be addressed through the building consent process, um, but it is something that obviously we can look at through the um, any um, amendment to provisions within the um, district plan itself as well. So I mean that this um, the recommendations in here aren't uh, the be all and end all of everything we're looking at. Obviously, this is just the the high level stuff and and probably uh, the most pressing matters for our city. Um, but certainly, it wouldn't prevent us having a look at um, you know, impacts on the city in, in, in terms of climate change, etc. Okay. I, I think in areas where there's no high pressure main system, it's obviously encouraged for firefighting purposes. But there's no reason that a review can't endorse. Or encourage people to gather roof water or, or brown water for uh, reuse. Thanks. So I think, from memory, it's done quite extensively in Australia as well, in in urban situations. Any other questions or comments? If not, it's been moved and seconded. I'll put that all in favour. Aye. Aye. Against. Carried. Thank you. Thank you. The Community Wellbeing Fund, um, two recommendations in there. Michael, welcome. Good afternoon. Um, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Very simple uh, report uh, with Councillor Crackett deciding to step back from this fund. Um, we need to amend the governance statement with a replacement. Councillor Soper has indicated she is willing to step in. Uh, but this, of course, is a decision for Council uh, to make. So while Council Sopa has indicated she's willing to step in, this is a decision for the committee to recommend on to Council. Um, happy to answer any questions, but it should be a relatively straightforward procedural report. I'll Thanks. move the appointment of Councillor Sopa. Thank you, Councillor Rabbit, and second to Councillor I'd Lewis. like to second it, but also I'd like to make the comment, if I may, Chair, that I really appreciate the, the input that Councillor Cracker has made over the years that I've been associated with the Community Wellbeing Fund and thank Councillor Sofa for stepping up to the plate. Thank you very much, both of you. Cheers. Thanks for those comments. It's been moved and seconded, Councillors. I'll put the motion. All in favour? No. Right. Against? Carried. While you're there, Michael, are you dealing with this next issue as well? The name change? No, no that is Mr Day. Ah, oh, beg your pardon. Sorry, Michael. Looking at the wrong Michael. You can never have too many Michaels. <laughs> Thank you. Through yourself, Chair, this is um, a <coughs> proposed name. Um, as you heard through the uh, district plan, um, there may be concerns around the subdivision, uh, the industrial area itself, but the subdivision is an approved subdivision. This is the naming within the um, subdivision in relation to the road. So it's been through um, Mana, Mana Whenua representation uh, review and through the Runaka. So um if there's i'll leave it open to any questions thank you are there any somebody like to move the recommendations reverend cook second yeah. act councillor kett any further comments if not it's been moved and seconded i'll put the motion all in favor right. 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 against right. carried which brings us to the activities report uh, Mr Chair, just before we start that report, I will have to apologise for departing at this stage. My flight is just being called. No problem, Councillor, and I'll signal that in the next item uh, we'll be placing that correction that you've pointed out to the minutes. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye, everyone. See you tomorrow. Right, Trudy. Kia ora koutou, councillors, your worship. Uh, I'd just like to draw attention to the improved performance for our non-notified uh, resource consent and the team continue to remain highly focused on meeting our required time frames. Uh, we continue to, uh, in terms of our building consents, we're still delivering a great experience in that space in terms of the turnaround time. And while we have seen the number of customers drop back, there's still, at our rates time, we see a peak come in to pay over the counter. Um, and I'll pass on to Mr Gibling to highlight any pieces of his world. Just before you do that, um, recognise a quick turnaround in that uh, change in reporting as well with the, um, the issues that we reported on at the last meeting. So thank you for that. Steve. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Councillors, Your Worship. Just one point to note in the report, um, and it's part of our ongoing approach to improving our reporting around the collections at uh, South Museum and Art Gallery. The team, up to the end of January, have packed and be ready for relocation about 76% of the items within our collection, and um, I know that they have made further progress over the last month and we'll be bringing more detailed reporting on that. Um, but happy to take any questions before I pass to Mr Day. No questions for Steve? Michael D. Thank you. Yourself, the Chair. Um, I'm going to take my sections as being read. It's merely um, indicating to the councillors around the uh, bylaws that are coming up uh, for consultation uh, fairly soon. I've got a hearing set down for that this month. Yes, okay. there is, councillor. Yeah. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Day? Nothing. Councillor Clark. Yeah, probably, probably more for Steve. Um, just wonder what the progress was on Anderson's house. Oh, thank you, Councillor. Um, look, in terms of the construction program, I think as noted, the construction program is to time. Um, our venues and events manager, Richard McCaw, is working with the Anderson House Trust at the moment around the proposal for the future operation and that will be coming back to or well, through Richard at this stage um, within the next month about what that future service looks like. What I think just on that when does that come back to to council for consideration? Uh, I need to confirm the time frames but it should be within the next two months. Okay thanks just looking for something indicative. You comfortable with that, Councillor Clark? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thanks. If there are no other questions, move that the activities report is received. Is there a seconder? Councillor Scout, thank you. Put that all in favour? Right. Aye. Aye. Against? Carried. And the minutes of the extraordinary meeting uh, from March 1st, there's one amendment that needs to be made, and that is that we need to include Councillor Soper as being present, particularly since I think she the move of a couple of motions in there. So with that amendment, Councillor Lewis will move, seconded by Councillor Skell. Any comments? If not, I'll put the motion. All in favour? Uh -huh. Against? Carried. There are no further items um, that I've got in open, so I'll move that we go into public exclude for the reasons that's laid out in the minutes, uh, the exception to be Obviously, the attendance. Oh, I, I beg your pardon. Sorry. Thank you, Steve, for waving that paper furiously at me. <laughs> we do have the um, minor late item. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, Last Tuesday, I briefed the committee on the potential changes that were related to the education outside the classroom and noted some of the issues at that time would make it impossible for council to accommodate those programs within our facilities. 
We also heard from Andrew Cameron um, that the use of the mandatory vaccine passes was a decision of council and that council could remove that requirement. So we, we didn't progress any further from that point aside from saying that we will bring back a report in April around the future use of the mandatory vaccine pass. However, the following day on Wednesday, I received an email from Sport New Zealand and Claire also received an email um, through the Chief Executives Network from the Department of Internal Affairs indicating that the Minister of Education has signalled further changes to the COVID-19 protection framework for curricular and extracurricular school activities, including the Education Outside the Classroom program. He indicated that this change will take place no later than the 15th of March and it will be legislated. These changes specifically will apply to council venues that are used for these activities and require a vaccine pass. So this, these new changes mean that for these venues, the vaccine pass requirements will be illegal for those participating in school related activities, curricular or extracurricular. The school children will in practice be exempt from any vaccine pass requirements imposed by council. Further, consistent with the original exemption for these venues from mandatory vaccine passes, there will be no requirement for facilities partition off space for these groups uh, in order to require uh, to comply sorry, for the EOTC requirements. This means essentially that children and young people are in school organised team, group or individual activity cannot be asked for a vaccine pass and must be treated by the activity organiser or venue operator as if they were vaccinated. So we understand that public health is supportive of removing the requirements for the MVPs for school sport, noting the high levels of vaccination coverage in the 12 to 17 year old age group. Uh, New Zealand's changing strategic approach to Omicron outbreak and the importance of school sport on student wellbeing, consistency with activities allowed during school time and the lower transmission risks in this setting compared to other settings. So we advised the committee last week that central government had indicated that it did not intend for vaccine mandates to be applied to school activities as we're looking into EITC and MVP relationships. Council was asked whether it wished to review the current mandate policy in light of those statements and we determined again that we'll bring that paper back in April. So essentially once the legislation is passed, Council will not be able to apply its vaccine mandate policy to these children and that is likely to occur on or around the 15th of March. So just clarifying that will happen as a matter of legislation and is outside of uh, Council's policy. And I guess the timeliness of the full review that we were looking at in mid late April doesn't really shift, but that's up to Council. Council can review its policy at any stage. Councillor Amundsen. Just a question of clarification. So this only applies to school related activities, not club activities, or if somebody just wanted to go to the swimming pool on the weekend and were unvaccinated, they couldn't do that. It's only if they're going with school or because of school that they have that exemption. Yes, Councillor, that is correct. And it is, they have to be associated with the school activity. Um, so they could attend, say, for example, Splash Palace on a Friday evening to play water polo and the vaccination exemption would apply. Uh, whereas on Saturday morning, going for a slide on the hydro slide, they would need to have the vaccine pass at this point. Another question of clarification before I come to Councillor Pottinger um, and Michael. Uh, Mr Morris, you might like to have your ear on this one too. Uh, what about parents who are accompanying um, those children on those school trips? They would not be exempt. Uh, that would be a matter for the education outside the classroom criteria to meet, but I understand that is the case. Okay. Councillor Pottinger. Uh, thank you. I guess, I guess I'm beating Nigel to the gun here. Is that, um, Sports activities at the stadium, that, that's a massive venue that you could have a potentially a school sport tournament, which is classed the same, I, I take it. Yeah. And so, and, and uh, say you got the big community courts there, 5,000 square metres, um, you could fit in heaps of people playing netball, volleyball, whatever. I mean, at the moment, it's heavily restricted to 100 people for 5,000 square metres. Mm. So that's all out the door. 
come the 15th? No, that's not my understanding. No. But that's, isn't that extra sport curricula? The, the requirement for a vaccination mandate passport um, or the mandatory vaccination passport, that's the thing that changes for this. That's what I mean. Um, but all of the other criteria under the red phase and phase three, they all still apply for those large scale gatherings and events. Um, uh, but it'd be fair to say until we actually see the content of the legislation, uh, we're just providing you an update on the direction of travel that the central government agencies ah. have sent us. The legislation hasn't been drafted and we haven't received any further detail about any other changes. We just understand it's related to education outside the classroom and the mandatory vaccination passport requirement for public facilities. Right, so the stadium is a public facility. If you have a sports day, and it doesn't have to be an outdoor sports day as far as athletics go, it could be an indoor sports day. So that still is determined by the 100 people type thing. Correct. Yeah, that's a bit mis yeah. miscued, isn't it? I guess they're still working through that. Yes. So yeah, that is correct. We, and that's, we can't really probably comment to no, no, that's not us. respective details of the facilities, but we do also want to signal that this is, this will apply to Haywakatuia mm -hmm. and will also apply to the library. Um, we've got advice through Sport New Zealand about Splash Palace, but it's the program that can run in all three of those facilities. So it will be something that we'll need to look at for all three facilities that mm -hmm. council own and operate. Councillor Lush. No, I'm, I, I, sorry, just to, to clarify, the, the pools, would, if, if we allowed people to run vaccinated, would that reduce the capacity from 100 to 25? Uh, because of the pool and the way we have set up the capacities, we we do have unique operating circumstances in there. We can put more than 100 people in those facilities. Um, each facility is unique, and so we've got a capacity in there. Um, off the top of my head, I can't recall, but it's well over 100 in this phase of operation. Um, that's part of the advice we're bringing back as to what do these changes mean for our operations and so I can't really give you that concrete advice right now but that will be following coming back in April. Thanks. Any other questions councillors? Councillor Skelt. Thank you through you Chief. I think the key to the matter is that again the, the message that's been given um, if we are we if we as venue operators and managers and as a council team are having difficulty understanding the latest yeah. edict that's come out. The issue we have already from parents is the very clear confusion they have <laughs> around their child going to the pool on Fridays within a school group and then whipping down there on Saturday. Or the same for a sports team coming into the venue and we'll use Stadium South as an example with a team on during the week. And then playing the team on Saturday netball, girls high play, girls high plays, girls high. Where does that leave us in that situation? Then we have the designated 100 stall for the venue. So all I'm saying is, again, we have a lack of clarification um, right throughout the country within venues around this piece. And I understand it's new. There's an update last night. Steve will be aware. But it's still, at the moment, extremely confusing. My major concern is for the venue managers dealing with the, the mums and the dads and the caregivers uh, we've got a massive anomaly on the, on the current policy as it sits, on the current policy. I no doubt Steve will get some more information in the next, but it's at the moment it's exceptionally confusing. We're getting massive feedback from parents. Noted. Councillors, uh, Councillor Clark, sorry. Thank you, Chair. Just a couple of issues. I just wanted to clarify with Steve. Because at one stage you said there would be implications for council, but then he made the reference to public facilities. And they're two different things, of course, because we don't own every public facility. And a good example is Stay in South, and we don't own that as a public facility, it's owned by a trust. Um, so they're not, uh, are you saying that the current feedback you're getting on these um, education outside classroom is, um, has an impact for council, um, council facilities, that is? Um, and that it allows um, access at times that they would normally be in the classroom, but they elect to go to swimming or whatever. But it also allows for sports teams that might be recognised under a particular school. 
Is that what I'm hearing? I can see you're nodding. Yes, that's correct, Councillor. Thank you. Right, councillors, it's it's really informative um, at this stage. You have already resolved to review in mid-April. Um, so uh, I'll move that uh, Mr Gibbling's verbal report is received. Seconded by Councillor Amundsen. Further comments or questions? Sorry, through you, Chair. I just wondered through Steve, should the legislation change dramatically, Steve, going forward within the next 10 days, do you envisage that we may have to make a a pretty abrupt change. Through you, Mr. Chair. Look, if, if the law changes, uh, we will have to follow the law. Yeah. And um, if that changes significantly beyond what we've advised here, I think we will be bringing back some more information to this council um, very quickly, just so that you understand the changes that we now have to follow. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Just as a follow-up, Chair, to uh, Councillor Skelt's uh, feedback, um, I'm, I'm not sure it's wise for us to leave that, that next consideration until the 12th of April. I think even if we don't make any decisions earlier than that, we should still um, come together somewhere along the line as soon as we know what the legislation is doing, because there is going to be a mass amount of inconsistency around things like you can come for a water poll on a Friday night because there's a competition coming on. But uh, where, where do you deal with boys high versus boys high on a Saturday? They might be wanting to practice their water polo. I mean, we, we shouldn't leave it a, another four month after the legislation kicks in. We've got enough uh, criticism already from a small sector of the public about the, uh, about the applications of the passports and our facilities. And we should look at uh, certainly at Hewakatui and the library and um, swimming pool uh, sooner than later on that. So I. So if there's something clear and concrete that comes through that is dramatically different, we have an opportunity to call an extraordinary PPP on either the 15th or the 22nd yeah. or the 29th and, and deal with them as, as exponentially as we can. Thank you. Thanks. So I'll move that the report is received. Councillor, sorry, Ms. Reverend Cook. Just a comment um, for clarification. Do we not have a quite low loading for Hewakatui already? So the implications for that in terms of education outside of the classroom would be a classroom sized group going in because that would be the capacity. So the changes required there um, might be minimal except that other public can go in there as well. So you've got a mixed message. You've got people who are attending because they want to, um, having to be vax passed, and a school group going in there who are not. And that's the issue of equity that council will have yeah. to deal with. It time. is, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and yeah. if I can answer that question, because it is, it is quite relevant to this topic. The defined airspace was one of the changes that have been signalled to change. And that defined airspace was enabling uh, separate groups to partake in an activity without um, crossing over, in a way, the, the air bubbles within a facility. That requirement, by the sounds of it, will be removed from this legislation. And that means that you can have public and school children interacting within the same air environment um, and again, that's why we've got to wait for the legislation to confirm the exact details on how we then implement this in our three facilities. So through you, Mr Chair, that's what I wish to comment on, is that it would be premature of us to presume that in this very rapidly changing environment, that what has been signalled to us will be what we receive on the 15th, mm -hmm. because with... Um, the number of cases that are exponentially <laughs> exploding around the place, there may be a rethink about this. We shouldn't actually make a decision today presuming what it might be next week. I don't think we have enough information to make a new decision at this point anyway. Councillor Pottinger. Um, yeah, just clarity on that. We, we actually don't make the decision that's legislation. As yeah. uh, Steve said, we do what we're told. If the government decided... Heavens Sorry, the, the decision was around council policy. Yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah, well, that's 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 never going to change, is it? Well, we've agreed to review it. Okay, anything else? 
If not, it's been moved and seconded. I'll put the motion. All in favour? Aye. Aye. Against? Carried. This uh, time I'll move that we go into public excluded to confirm the minutes of PPPPX from February 8th and February 22nd and to receive the property investments update report, uh, excluding obviously Mr Grant and for the reasons as laid out in the agenda. Second for that, Councillor Lewis, I'll put it all in favour. Aye. Against, carried for those who've joined us on the live stream. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon.